our first speaker this morning is Atali, Atali Tishbi from Hebrew University, and he will talk about the deep bottleneck theory of deep neural networks. Uh, what can you tell us about biological states? All right, good morning. Uh, thank you, Fritz. And, and, uh, I it was actually, as some of you may have noticed, I had another title in the, in the plan. But so essentially, I have two talks which are, which could fit this uh, this workshop. Uh, one is on uh, application of information theory to control and to actually neural data analysis. And and but after hearing uh, the talks in the first two days and uh, the issues uh, that were, was, were raised here, I decided actually to go back to something I've been talking uh, quite a lot about in the past year and, and we'll talk uh, and, but and which made some sort of uh, buzz in the machine learning community in the last year which is some sort of uh, I believe a deeper understanding of uh, deep neural networks and uh, and uh, since many of you are using uh, deep learning uh, all over the place and, and there were several talks already on trying to interpret what deep learning is actually telling us about data about <coughs> neural data I thought that the theory is sufficiently interesting and not there are many here who never heard about it uh, to, to actually uh, connect it with uh, biological brains and since we have relatively long time the second part of my talk I'll go back to the data or at least what I believe this type of analysis is telling us about the brain so uh, I don't have uh, in this community to to remind you the the fascinating uh, history of uh, deep neural networks mm -hmm. but uh, you know, for, for people like me who have been around, uh, actually been thinking about neural networks since the, the mid 80s, uh, since the Hopfield model essentially, uh, I, 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 this is quite a, a roller coaster which, uh, which is uh, fascinating and it's a piece of history. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, it's coming back again in, in some new ways and uh, in this new version of many layers and it's doing uh, some sort of uh, miracles uh, to, to, the, to essentially everything in machine learning, vision, speech, uh, and language, and natural language processing, uh, bioinformatics, uh, uh, control, uh, whatever you want, in, in, all, in many versions of this story, I mean, many layers within, with feedback, without feedback, uh, uh, with all sorts of uh, different architectures. Uh, I, I <laughs> This clearly requires some sort of, uh, of uh, a theory. I mean, the, the frustrating uh, part of the story of deep learning is that we all knew that it's there. It didn't work that well in the 80s, uh, or at least not uh, seems to saturate in, in performance in some sense. And, and, but with the emergence of uh, much larger scale problems, I mean, the problem grew up by at least two or three orders of magnitude in terms of the size of the inputs and, uh, and, uh, and the, com the size of the data, and of course the, the power of the computation, uh, we're actually in a different game now, in my, in my opinion. And, and essentially the old idea is that we, some of us started to think about uh, in the late 80s, I mean the statistical physics of, of neural networks, uh, which is uh, very different from the in, in flavor and in principle from the kind of theories that people use in computer science because it's not a worst case bound on, on generalization. It, it's not distribution free. It's, it doesn't have all these nice uh, features of, uh, of the, the standard theory, at least in the machine learning theory. But this type of typical behavior, large scale problem, uh, large scale analysis becomes uh, much more relevant now. And I actually argue that this is the way to think about uh, deep neural networks today. So for me, this is bringing me back to the 80s. Uh, but and, and some of the old ideas that we started to conceive then uh, become very relevant today. <laughs> so essentially, you know, since the late uh, 2000, 2006, 7, 8, 9, when deep neural networks uh, and, uh, in the hands of, uh, you know, Jeff Hinton and, and his people and, and Jan LeCun and a few others, uh, started to uh, revolutionize machine learning, there were essentially two types of approaches. One, okay, you know, this seems to work. <laughs> Uh, let's use it everywhere we can and uh, don't ask too many questions about why it works. <laughs> uh, definitely don't try to interpret it in any, any, any sensible way. Few people, very few people, uh, uh, were very concerned about the fact that it works so well and we don't understand it. I mean, this is not the way you want a theory of, a fundamental theory of machine learning to look like. So I 
got back to this actually with uh, some people who about five years ago with Noga who is sitting here and uh, later on with, with Ravid uh, Ziv who is uh, responsible for many of the simulations and, and analysis that we will show you today. Um, essentially revisiting an old idea that in the late 90s we called uh, the information bottleneck uh, method. Which is essentially, I, can see, I thought about it in the context of speech recognition actually. I mean, this should be uh, the right way of extracting the relevant feature out of a high dimensional data with a lot of irrelevant dimensions. And speech is certainly, speech, speech in the context of text to speech, speech to text, is actually very much like this. I mean, there, there's a very high entropy variable which we call the speech, and a very low entropy variable which we call the text. And the question was how to reduce the excess entropy in the speech uh, signal. To, the, to, to tell us exactly what we need to know about the text. And this is, of course, true also for any problem you know in, in vision. You want to label a face. You want to, uh, I mean, th this is really the standard structure of the problem. And so essentially, we are talking about networks which have a, a very high entropy input, like pixels of an image, and a very low entropy output or label, which can be just one bit. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, OK, what's actually happening in, in during this uh, cascade of transformations of representation? No, I, I'm stalling some time because I see people are still coming. So I don't think you think that you all know. But it's all right. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so essentially what we did or we are doing, uh, it's still very much in, in the working, is combining uh, three different components, which I believe are really as in, all important to understand the story. The first one is really we're really thinking about statistical learning theory. So as I already said, I mean the fact, the fact that we are moving from relatively small problems, uh, you know, hundreds of inputs or thousands of inputs, to very large problems, uh, millions and hundreds of millions of inputs, uh, is, uh, should take us from the what we call PAC or probability approximately correct like theory, which was essentially started in 1982 with the work of Les Valiant and, and, and then merged with the work of Vapnik and, and a few others in, in Russia and others. Essentially, it's giving us the dream of statisticians. I mean, bound on the generalization error, on the probability of making an error outside your training data in a way which is independent of the problem itself, independent of the distribution, and uh, depends only on something which we call the hypothesis class or the, the complexity of the algorithm, the, the function that we can approximate. And this looks like you know, the, a beautiful and very elegant way of thinking about learning. And it's still very elegant. The question is, is it useful? So I actually argue that one of the mistakes that people are doing with deep learning is they focus on the hypothesis class. <laughs> what, what type of functions these layers, these networks can actually approximate, what they call the expressivity of the networks which is essentially trying to fit neural networks into the old framework of uh, uh, distribution independent bounds. And uh, whether we like it or not, these bounds don't work. I mean, they don't tell us anything about the actual complexity uh, uh, of the problem, and the actual uh, sample complexity of the problem, I mean, which means how many examples you actually need in order to generalize well. And what I suggest is to shift them to what I call input compression bounds which are distribution specific, they depend on the problem, but they're independent of the architecture of the machine in some, in some very important way. Which shifts the focus from the expressivity of what these networks can actually fit to something different, which is really data dependent or problem dependent, but architecture independent. And therefore, if I'm right, this should hold not only for deep neural networks, but for anything that learns this problem, including our brain. If you're talking about the same visual problem, say, or the same speech problem, or whatever it is. No. The second ingredient, which has to do with this large scale problem, we, we should go back to what we call typical behavior, and uh, not the worst case behavior. And, and since the problems are large, there is some sort of measure concentration that we all know from statistical mechanics or from information theory, which holds for this type of uh, problems under some technical condition, which I will tell something, say something about. But then 
once you go back to typical inputs, not just not the worst case input, I really don't care if I misclassify a very distorted image. I mean, no one complain, complains about it. I want to classify the typical what I usually see. And, and uh, uh, just like I don't care if I you know, have an accident with an autonomous car under you know, very extreme conditions that, that anyone, no, nobody can foresee, but see, I, I really care about the bulk. And the larger the problem, the more important it is. So luckily, we actually have a theoretical understanding of large problems under some conditions. And this measure concentration on this, the fact that eventually when the problem becomes very large, it's actually controlled by very few parameters, is saving us here. Now, the third ingredient, I mean, actually information theory alone, is not telling us anything about uh, the computational complexity of the problem. And I'll argue again why. Uh, but uh, so we need something else which tells us, and it's as important as everything else in this story, why are these networks converge in a reasonable time on very large problems? And is there something special about this stupid algorithm which we call stochastic gradient descent, which is essentially you know, minimizing the error uh, uh, by small steps approximately <laughs> with noise? Uh, is there anything special about it? And actually, I argue, yes, there is. There is some, in, some you know, historical luck or conspiracy and that why this particular algorithm is working so well with the two previous uh, uh, things that I'm talking about. And essentially, it all boils down to the idea that the network is eventually <coughs> compressing the representation from layer to layer in terms of forgetting more and more information about the input while squeezing out or extracting only the relevant bits. And it turns out that if you actually use stochastic gradient descent, due to well-known 100 years old the properties of, of, uh, of uh, large event equations of, of stochastic gradient descent, which converge to some sort of a maximum entropy or Gibbs-like distribution, this particular, even if only, it's only approximately, only locally, and that's what actually happens, it's not global Gibbs distribution, and it's different temperatures or different uh, type of, uh, uh, of uh, measure in different places of the space. But because of it, somehow they managed to compress this ir these irrelevant details of the problem very efficiently. All right. So this is the theory. And I really want to go through it uh, faster because much of it is have received a lot of attention in the past year, and many people have seen it. So, uh, so the, the idea is, is that when you look at neural networks, yes? Uh, just a clarification question. So there are plenty of uh, neural network applications where the output is sort of as complicated as the input. So for example, a neural machine translation translating from English right. to German. Right. Uh, all, all the generative approaches, I mean guns and, and things like this, which essentially regenerate patterns as, which are as complex as the input. So I'm just trying to clarify whether or not what you'll be speaking about will be speaking up to those types of problems as well or not. Not, not, not directly. So first of all, yeah, I'm, I'm now speaking about the plain vanilla old type of supervised learning which has this uh, complex input, and, uh, complex input and, and simple output. So I should just think classification. Yes, but. <laughs> We have been thinking uh, seriously, I don't have enough students for that, but uh, on, on how to extend it to, to guns and to resnets and to many other things, which seem to be working in the opposite direction. Where you actually, instead of compressing, you, you compress and then decompress in some sense. And, and, and this decompression is, is doing something interesting because it's not just adding noise, it's reconstructing the features in a reasonable way. So I believe that in some sense reversing this theory backward, I mean, from the output to the input is, 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 not, uh, is not so stupid I mean, and, and, and can be done. And, but, so I'm not going to ignore this question, certainly, but I'm not going to say much about it. Let's understand first the simple, simple things first. <laughs> now, uh, so as you all know, I mean, uh, this type of networks, uh, I just want some notation here. So let's call the input x, this high variable, uh, high entropy variable, high dimensional variable, and the output y, and this, it, I, distinct, I make a distinction here between the desired output y, this is what, what we call the generalization, the true output or the desired output, which is uh, usually we get only a sample, which we call data, of this joint distribution of x and y. And in many cases, it's actually a stochastic distribution. It's not a deterministic rule. Even if you think about it as deterministic, 
in, in practice, actually argue that the problem for which deep learning works is where, where the problem is, is relatively stable in the sense that it, it's not very sensitive to small perturbation of the input. And, and therefore, uh, and this is actually very, a very well-defined well st st notion which we can, which is actually very popular in machine learning today, is it's considered one of the better formulation of generalization uh, stability, uh, better than VC dimensions, things like this. But, uh, but it's still uh, this uh, stability which actually gives us only a probability of the label as a smooth variable, not just the label itself. So I think I'm just sampling a joint distribution which can and should be stochastic. Now, on the other hand, the network is now moving in a feed-forward way through essentially a Markov chain of internal representation. That's the first layer, the second layer, and so on. Each one of them depends only, I mean, after training, only on the previous layer. So it certainly is the first of the Markov chain. And eventually, the last hidden layer HM here uh, essentially uh, 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 generates a good prediction of the original label Y, which I call here Y hat. And Y hat is not Y because if they're identical, then I'm perfectly, I've perfectly learned the problem. In general, it's different. And the, the goal is really to get Y hat as close as possible to Y, at least statistically. So the probability of this label is going to be the same. And actually, we treat it statistically in most cases. We actually use the log loss or the cross entropy loss to train the network, which means we actually interpret the output of the layer, the last layer, as a probability of the label. Now, because it's some sort of a sigmoid, and, and that's what we actually do. Now, uh, the question is, of course, what happens during those uh, transformations. So I'm sure all of you know what information, mutual information is, but since this is not only a theoretical audience, uh, let me just remind you again. So information theory is an entropic uh, type uh, a quantity which is directly related to the expectation of the log likelihood ratio of two distributions, which is what we call the KL divergence or the, the cross entropy, or it has many different names. And so this is really a fundamental quantity. What is the average of the log likelihood of two distributions? If, and if I average it with respect to the, let's say the, the top distribution, it's not necessarily symmetric. This is a non-negative number, which is zero precisely when the two distributions are almost equal, almost everywhere equal. And the, from it, I can derive a measure which has a lot to be said about, but I want here just one property or two properties of it. The mutual information of two variables essentially is how much uncertainty in one variable is reduced by knowing another variable. So if I measure uncertainty by entropy, uh, it's essentially the entropy in the variable minus the conditional entropy of this variable given the the other variable. And this is the symmetric quantity, uh, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, and it's just the, the scale divergence in the joint distribution of the two variables with respect to the product of their marginals. And again, this is precisely zero when they are independent. Okay. Now, the mutual information has many good properties. Actually, it's a generating function of, of information theory in some sense, both source coding and channel coding. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's what I need here is essentially one property which is known as the Markov, as the data processing inequality which is if I'm moving along a Markov chain like the layers of a deep neural network, uh, information cannot increase. So information about the input in the first layer cannot be, in the second layer, let's say, cannot be larger than information about the input in the second layer. And since I'm thinking about the desired output, Y as extending to the right of, to the left of my chain, the information about the output is also only decreasing. Now another, immediate consequence of this data processing inequality, which is very intuitive, it actually holds for many other measures, uh, we, you know, we understand them very well, is, is, is that information information is invariant to reparameterization. So if I take any permutation of my variables or any one-to-one -one function, even for continuous variables, I'm not going to lose information. Now this means that if I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to focus on mutual information measure between layers and inputs and layers and outputs, this is going to be my main message, this is completely invariant to whatever one-to-one -one reparameterization you can do to the layers. This is the fundamental reason why information theory doesn't tell us much about complexity, computational complexity, because, because those measures are, I can encrypt my data through a very complicated one-to-one -one function, and uh, mutual information is at least in, in principle unchanged. 
course, there's a big question, how do I measure mutual information between encrypted variables? Because I need, I need somehow to break the encryption. <laughs> I mean, I need, otherwise, I, I, if I give you an encrypted image and the labels, no neural network uh, today, as far as I know, is going to make sense of it. Unless it has some additional computational power to solve very hard problems. But mutual information is not telling you anything about it, in principle. So there is already here in this definition of mutual information some sort of strong caveat of how do I estimate it. Uh, and in order to estimate it, I need to do some coarse graining of the problem and you do some binning or do something like this, which, which is eventually the heart of the criticism that I actually get for this paper, but never mind. So as I said, I mean, so if I apply the data processing inequality to deep neural network, I get these two chains of inequalities, which means that information in the layer is all going down, and information about the label, the true label, again, the generalization error, is, is going down. And of course, the first observation is that each one of those layers is actually inducing a partition of the input. So it's some sort of, if you think about the, the layer as discretized, let's say only binary neurons, or one plus minus one neurons, then it's clear that the same layer can have many inputs mapped into it. Now, even if it's not exactly binary, I, I, I smooth it through a sigmoid or through some other linearity, there's still some sort of coarsening of the input in each of the layers. So it is the properties of, of this partition which is really important. I mean, and, and eventually I argue that it's only two numbers that I really care about in this partition in order to characterize the, the complexity, the, 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 the sample complexity of the problem. So, okay, so I'm sorry for, again, switching uh, notations here, but so just... Uh, just tell us, what, what do you mean by soft partitioning? Soft partitioning is if I now, if, if the neurons are not plus minus one, not, not hyperbolic, but something like hyperbolic tangent, or, or some smooth function like a sigmoid, then uh, it gets values between zero and one. Okay. So this is going to induce a soft partition in the sense that the boundaries within the partition are not as sharp as... as okay, is. but this topologically the same thing? Uh, no, so, so of course here you're getting into a mathematical mess because if you're talking about one-to-one -one functions and with infinite precisions, then you don't lose information in, the, in this one-to-one -one mess. But in practice, <laughs> with finite precision, these, these uh, neurons are always uh, discretized in some sense, and this is actually quite crucial. Yeah. So, so the, 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 you know, the uh, nonlinearity of choice these days is rectified linear units. Right. Relatives. Right. And they're zero below some threshold. Right. So this is definitely lossy. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, w one way of thinking about this partition is that you basically, if it's below threshold, it's like it's not there. Right. right? Like you've you've taken a subset of the units and and uh, you've gotten rid of all the information in the ones that are below zero, and then you're just taking a subset that you're promoting to the next layer. Right. Yeah. So so right. so. I'll, so I'll, one more question along yeah. just so we're, we're all with you. When you say partition, does that imply an equivalence class structure <coughs> on the input? Yes. So yeah. there are many different images that's, uh, that are mapped to the same layer. I see. So okay. every image in this class is equivalent in that sense. So it's equivalent class, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just you need to be a little more careful mathematically how to deal with the soft right. edges. So it's, once, it gets so, once it gets soft, you lose the equivalence class structure because there are yes. images. Yes, so then, then you have to actually talk either in terms of probability of being mapped to some of the parts, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is a stochastic partition, or to, and which is really the way I want to think about it, or, or, the, or some sort of other, uh, what do you mean by that it's 0 0.5 here and 0 0.4 here, or something like this. Uh, probability is actually the right way I think of thinking about it. So, so your second point there about successive refinement, yes. what, does, what does that imply about the equivalence class structure? Okay, so successive refinement is something else. This is for information theorists. I mean, so I leave it, I mean, I'm actually arguing eventually that the layers are going to successively coarsen their presentation, just because it's a Markov chain. By, by, by course, you mean increase the size of these equations. That's right, classes. right. So each layer further away from the input is coarser, a coarser partition, because it can only merge or smooth somehow the previous layer. Mm -hmm. and, and, and therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's going to uh, refine or, or coarsen the representation from layer to layer. And, and, and uh, in information theory, in rate distortion theory, we actually talk about successively refinable codes which are essentially codes that uh, successively refine the previous precision by adding more bits to the code. And, and this is actually something very similar to what we actually see here. Okay, I'll come back to this. So another slightly different way of thinking about it is to think about each layer here, let's say the layer Ti, which is the same as Hi before, never mind that, 
uh, as, as being an, some sort of encoded, some, there's some code, some stochastic map in general that maps the input to this layer, to the value of this layer, which I call the encoder of the layer. And there's stochastic map from the layer to the output, which I call the decoder of the layer. Now, the first layer has a trivial encoder and very complicated decoder. Once we move through the layers, the encoder becomes more and more complicated and the decoder becomes much simpler. And eventually, in the last layer, the decoder is just linearly separable problem. I mean, just an hyperplane that cuts my, my, my face somehow. It's a very simple decoder, but the, the encoder is very complicated. So there is some inter, interesting inter, interplay between the, the complexity of the encoder and the decoder of each layer when you move through the layers. Now, my main theoretical argument, which I am only very Wait, wait, Roughly this, sketch here. Does this apply to autoencoders? So what, what you're doing with the autoencoder is you're squeezing <laughs> the middle layer is. is yeah. So, so this goes back to this question. Uh, autoencoders have this, you know, expansion again. Right. But, and but in a sense, it, it's kind of like reversing because you have to reproduce the input, right? It's not like. It's yes. Yes. But the Markov chain is still there. You are not getting yeah, information. No, no, I'm just wondering how that would fit into this uh, framework. Would it fit? Yes. It would. Okay. Yeah, but somehow there's some, some, something interesting happens in the way you expand your, your image. I give you a caricature of a cat, and you somehow fill in the details. In the right way, it looks like a cat to you. But the information about the input is not increasing. I'm moving along a chain, unless I have some feedback connections. By the way, weak feedback connections don't have this theory at all, as long as the net flow of information is involved. And of course, lateral connections don't, don't help me either. I mean, they don't tend the Markovianity of this, uh, of this, uh, this argument. So, uh, so I actually argue, and I know that this sounds like crazy to many people, uh, that it's only the mutual information of the encoder and the decoder of the layer which really is very important, eventually for large enough problems, for what I call typical, typically large inputs. Now, so, which means, okay, I am throwing away the complexity of the problem completely, focusing on two numbers per layer only. How much information, mutual information, it contains on the input, on average? I mean, this is average of all inputs. Of course, this is a statistical measure, which is not easy to estimate in, in, hard problem, in large problems. And, and how much information it contains about the output. Now, essentially, what I'm saying is that the mutual information about the output, the desired output, the true label, is essentially controlling or bounding the, the generalization error. So if this is high, the generalization is low, and this becomes tight uh, for large enough problems in some sense, in a sense which is quite, becomes very clear today. And the, so the log loss in some sense is a good bound on every reasonable loss that you can imagine. And if this is low, which means high information, then, then I'm good with any other measure of accuracy. Okay, the second one, the second argument, which is harder to grasp, is that the mutual information from the input to the layer is actually governing the, complex, the sample complexity, how many examples I need. The lower it is, the lower the number of examples I need in order to generalize well. So essentially, it's the last hidden layer which is going to induce the most compression of the problem. And so it's these properties. The, encoder mutual information of the last hidden layer and the decoder mutual information of the last hidden layer, which essentially govern the sample complexity of the problem. I don't need to know anything else. Now, so T is, uh, is the layer, any one of the layers. So but uh, in, in this particular statement, it's the last hidden layer. The last, the last hidden layer, yeah. OK, so uh, I want to justify this, <laughs> this bold claim, yeah. But when do you look at this mutual information between x and y? Well, I, I, I now, I'm now playing uh, mm -hmm. God, and I'm playing the physicist game. I know everything, I know everything about the problem. So I assume that I'm, uh, I know the joint distribution of x and y, the true one. And with it, I can actually estimate the mutual information uh, uh, for small problems, at least. For large problems, it become, becomes technically uh, so after, after, after. So no, so, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show you a lot about it. Okay, so what I'm going to use all over the talk from now on are those types of pictures, which I call the information plan, or sometimes we call them rate relevance uh, trade off. So essentially, the x axis here is the information a layer contains about the input of the problem, and the y axis is the, this mutual information that a layer contains about the outer problem. And what you see here is in, in circles, it's different colors, 
are the layers of uh, a six hidden layer small neural network. It's too small, to, to, too embarrassing to say how small it is, but it's not important. <laughs> it's large enough for some of the typicality argument that I'm going to make uh, to good hold, and this is something I'm willing to argue on. And, uh, and uh, what you see in different colors, so the right, the, the top, the top uh, uh, right here is the, essentially the, the, the initial layer, or the first hidden layer in blue. Actually, there are several layers there. So each point is a data? So each point is a net neural network, a whole neural network, a whole network. trained on, on, some, on some data. In this case, most of the data, 80% of the trained data. It's a small problem. It has only 12 bits of inputs and so on. But uh, I, I argue that this is not important. So essentially, there are 12 bits of entropy to the input. So this is the maximum. 12 is the maximum entropy uh, in this case uh, of the input. And, uh, and, uh, and one bit of output. It's a binary label. Okay. Okay. Does it matter what the problem was? Yeah, I, I'll tell you more about the problem later. Okay. I, I argue that these type of pictures are irrelevant, uh, independent of the, the, the nature of the problem. We see it everywhere. Now, what you see here is the initialization, a random initialization of the network with Gaussian weights, uh, 0, 1 Gaussian net, where net weights, fully connected, no, no, no convolutions, nothing, no tricks. About, uh, about the architecture. Now, uh, it turns out not to matter either. Uh, and what you see is due to the architecture of the network, because the network has narrower and narrower layers, the information drops very quickly. And the last hidden layer, which is uh, this orange uh, uh, circles, uh, uh, have very little information about both the input and the output. Now, the randomization here is due to random, different random initial conditions of the, of the, uh, of the net weights and different order of the sample. Excuse Not me. only order, a different sample. Blue is which layer? So blue is the, the first hidden layer, first. closest to the input, ah. and, and orange is the last hidden layer, further away from the input. Now what we did here uh, with Ovid, and actually something I did, we, we started to talk about with Noga a long time ago, uh, is, is simply train the network with stochastic gradient descent, and watched how these different layers actually evolve in this information plan. So this is uh, before training? This is before training. This is the initial conditions. Now, What's there are many, many issues which are already raised just by looking at this question. Just a second. Let me finish this. this, this basic, basic clarification. I don't understand how the output label is somehow, if there's information about it in a randomly connected network. There's no. I see that this the, is after the, learning. This is after learning. The last this layer. The, no, this is before learning. This, this is, is the initial train, the initial conditions of initial the train. Condition. Okay. Now, there's no. We see that this cascade of random maps, since I'm actually reducing the dimensionality, is losing information. And you see that the last hidden layer has essentially no information about so it. So are you sending the, 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 the class label through the network as well? No, I'm, I'm looking at the network trained with back propagation in a vanilla flavor of it without general regularization, without anything. I'm not training it yet. And I simply look at each representation at the whole layer. This is important. Not one urine. The whole layer is one random variable. This is, this is actually going to be important in the, next, in the second part. And, and, uh, and, so and, and this is information, but this is just the, the information processing inequality that we're looking at. Yes. Right? That's it. Right. So this is just that. Right. Now, you are right. If I had, uh, from some reason, let's say, keep all the layers of the same width, or, or, do, or, or even expand the layers, then uh, random uh, maps will not lose information. And I will not, I'll see something completely different. This is because the, the network is, has this Eiffel Tower structure. Now, so the, the random projection to low dimensions in, in, in of essentially every problem is not going to keep much information. Now, of course, if I think about it mathematically as a one-to-one -one with infinite precision, then, uh, you know, with sigmoidal inputs or with, uh, there's actually a lot of information left. But it's not if you actually bin the layers, discretize the layers correctly. And that's something I'm not going to get into, but it's very important. Now, the second question that comes out of just looking at this question, yeah, Why is it that all these 100 layers seem to occupy more or less the same area in this plane? So or in other words, why are they concentrated? So I'll talk more about it. But first of all, I want to show you what actually happens when you start training the network. So you see here the number of epochs uh, up there. This is uh, epoch 0, which means I haven't trained the network yet. <laughs> now I'm trying to start a stochastic gradient descent training. And, and what happens is that uh, this is what happens. 
Right? So this move usually wakes up people there. <laughs> so essentially, essentially uh, what you saw there, and you obviously need to be repeated, is that up to this point, more or less, which is around 300 epochs of training. Now, just to remind you, epoch is a cycle through the whole data with the mini batches and everything. And eventually, I just process the whole training data through all the layers. OK? This is an epoch. So after three, it, 300 iterations of this type, you get to this point, which surprisingly look more or less linear. Well, I actually argue why is it, and we understand very well why it is. And, 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 and of course, it's going down because of data processing inequality again. But what is really remarkable, it's relatively fast motion to this point. And as you could see, all the layers essentially increase their information about the input. So at this point, they have the maximum information about the input. And then from here on, some start something completely different. Essentially, they just, uh, so OK, look at this. Uh, this is fast, the fast conversion at this point. And from this point on, they slowly move to the left and up. And eventually, the layers all do this slow motion to the left, which I call the input compression. All of them, not only the last layer. And the last layer gets to essentially one bit of information, which, is, which means good generalization. Good generalization. And it's not only fitting the data. Now, the first question, as I said, why do they concentrate? Why these very different layers? And actually, I argue they're very different neurons. I mean, it's not only the connections are different, what the neurons are present is very different. And why do they all look like one point in this plane? So this is really the reason this plane is the, what I call the right order parameters. This is the, it somehow throw away all the irrelevant dimensionalities. And what does it mean that they first move up and then they slowly move to the left? What in the training algorithm, the stochastic gradient descent, is doing that? OK. So the rest of, uh, I don't know how much time I already used, but the rest of, let's say, the ten, next 15 minutes, I'm going to try to co explain what's going on here and convince you that this is a very general phenomena and actually very fundamental to understanding of deep learning. And then I'll show you that this understanding is actually giving us some new insights on the most fundamental questions of deep learning, why the layers help me, what do they represent, how to fit an architecture to a problem, and so on. OK. Yes? Uh, so the deviation from, from 1.0 is discretization. I'm sorry? The deviations of some points from Yeah, so the fact that they scatter is because I, I still have randomness in, in, in my training. And I can tell you already that the problem, the larger the problem, the more, the more concentrated it is. So this is a very small problem. 12 input, you know, it's a ridiculously small problem. But uh, it's still large enough such that some of these typicality asymptotic arguments work. And when I train larger problems, and actually train today, you know, CIFAR 10 and things like this, uh, and we see even with one network essentially the average of this cloud. OK, so it is really has been the, my own uh, focus uh, for a while to try to explain this phenomenon and to see how general it is. So this has actually captured the attention of Quantum Magazine in September. And this is the average. So this is the this is a picture from Quantum Magazine, just our picture, just put some nice labels on it, somehow using it. So this is essentially the story. What you see here in, in the green lines are those traces, average per layer. And what you see is, again, from A to C, very quickly, you see it's a very faint uh, uh, trace, because there are, it happens fast. Uh, you get uh, this, uh, what I call the maximum information place. Uh, this is the most expansion. This is where I remember the most about the problem. And most of the epochs, from 300 to 10,000 in this experiment, are spent on this compression, or, or this forgetting of the input. OK, so again, I mean, the whole thing is still debatable. And there are people all over the world who disagree with this generality, generality of this picture. But we see it in, uh, in essentially everything we look at if we just correctly measure the information. And this is actually a tricky thing. I mean, how do you bin and, or how do you discretize the, the layers such as to actually estimate information correctly? If you, if you use ReLUs, for example, it's a lot trickier because, the, because you need to bin into finite levels somehow. So you need to take actually the, the, the distribution of the, the value of the, of, the, of the units, not the weights, the units. 
and eventually discretize it according to the CDF of this, of this distribution. That's what we do. Now, the question is, OK, so first of all, you see already all the remarkable features of this uh, visualization of deep neural networks. You see that the layers move very, very slowly. All the layers, even the first few, even if they don't have to forget anything, they eventually move to the left, which means they forget information, forget details of the, of the problem. And they get stuck in, in some places. I mean, layer 5 is, is the last one here, and so on. You see that the, the other layers don't push all the way to perfect information. They get stuck in the middle. So yes? I think you'd be careful when you say <clears throat> it forgets details. Yes. It's the <clears throat> It's the irrelevant details, right? Right, and I'm going to argue why it's irrelevant details. What you want to do is to preserve the relevant details, but th that's only a small subset of all That's right. Details. It's a very tiny, low-dimensional fraction. You know, the same manifold that we heard about so, so often, including from you. I mean, it's, it's, it's this low-dimensional manifold of data, and I'm going to show you exactly what happens. So essentially, or at least visualize in some sense, how those layers forget details. But what is really fascinating, oh, <laughs> Striking to me is that not all the layers go all the way to the end. They, they do it uh, in parallel and they get stuck in the middle. So, so some of those layers actually represent more than you need. And the lower, the lower you are, you get more information which is irrelevant for the particular task. It's only the last layer which essentially is really squeezing only what you need. So what does overtraining look like in this diagram? Just a second. I'll, I'll come back to this. So again, okay. so now you can ask all sorts of questions. Um, so first of all, of course, why, why compression helps? I mean, okay, I, I thought it's quite obvious, but it's not. I mean, that uh, why losing information about the input is actually helping generalization. Okay, so, so here I have some uh, theoretical uh, arguments, which I, I'm not sure I won't, uh, okay, I, I'll say them anyway. So, so the classical generalization bounds like bounds, I mean, which we use all the time in learning, I mean, those, uh, those type of bounds. These are, uh, these have, have essentially this, this type of structure. The generalization error, which is epsilon, which means the probability of making an error out of my training data, uh, square in, in most cases, because we use the Hofding inequality or the channel bound, uh, is, is bounded by the log of the cardinality of the hypothesis class. What is the hypothesis class? Are uh, those functions that can be approximated by my, my network. OK? This is the classical theory. So I know if you learn rectangles in the plan, these are rectangles. <laughs> if you learn circles, these are circles, and so on. And, and the, the higher the complexity of this class, the more functions you can approximate. And therefore, it's the logarithm of the number of functions in this class. This is true for finite classes. But usually we don't have finite classes, so we approximate them with what we call an epsilon grid or an epsilon approximation. We find epsilon cover of my hypothesis class with, spe with spheres such that the probability of mislabeling two uh, of uh, disagreement between two hypotheses in this, in this sphere is less than epsilon. And what we actually put there is the cardinality of the epsilon cover of the hypothesis class. Now, the dominant the, the main factors here are this, the log of the cardinality of the, of the cover divided by the number of training example, which is n. This is a the classical theory. Now, in general, we have this very nice uh, dimensionality argument that tell us that we can, if we can cover, the, if the, the class has some sort of a finite dimensionality, which can be a VC dimension or Hausdorff dimension or shattering dimension or polar dimension or whatever. And there are many, many different names that which essentially tell you the same thing. If you can cover it with spheres of size epsilon, usually if it has dimension d, the cardinality of the cover scales like 1 over epsilon to the dimension. And again, mathematicians here know this very well. I mean, line d is 1, plane d is 2. This can be fractional dimension. This can be many things. OK. Now, so we plug this 1 over epsilon to the d in this uh, log cardinality bound. You get d over m as the main factor. OK, so this is nice. As long as the number of examples is smaller than the dimension of the hypothesis class, you don't generalize. Once the number of examples great li get larger than, than d, and uh, these bounds become meaningful. Very nice. This is the essence of learning theory as it stands today. What is confidence? Yeah, the confidence is, the, is something that uh, statisticians really worry about, is the probability that you actually got a very bad sample. <laughs> 
So the whole thing is true with probability 1 minus delta. Now, once you get to very, very large data sets, as we actually do, the probability of getting 10 million non-typical images of the wrong sample at that size is zero. Forget about it. But even if you, want, if you put the delta to be 10 to the minus 10, OK, so this is 10 compared to m, which is millions. OK, so this is, not, this is negligible. It's really not important. Although in learning theory, we really like to keep this delta all over the place because it makes us happy, mathemat mathematically happy. For large problems, this is completely not important. No. But what is really important is that this type of analysis, this type of bounds, don't seem to work for deep learning networks. I mean, they don't give us anything useful. They essentially just see it. I mean, if you look at the the base dimension of a neural network is of the order of the number of weights. I mean, if there's convolutions and, and there are many other reductions, so it's not the number of weights, the number of weights, uh, the square of the number of weights. Or oh, I don't know, it's something, uh, or oh, I don't know, something. But it's, 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 it's much larger than, orders of magnitude larger than the number of examples, which are also large. So we have 10 million uh, parameters and we have 100,000 examples, and we already generalize very well. So this doesn't explain why they generalize well. So essentially what I suggest, and it turned out to relate to what other people suggested before me, uh, which is the compression bounds, the stability bounds, and many other things, is let's, instead of thinking about the hypothesis class, let's think about all the functions. OK, so we have all the Boolean functions from x. The number of functions is 2 to the cardinality of x. This is bad. <laughs> if, I, if you plug this in the log, you get that the number of examples is of the order of the cardinality of x. No good. <laughs> So instead of thinking about reduction of the class by simplifying the hypothesis class, let's simplify the input. So let's cover the input by, by spheres. So think about x as the input, uh, as this is the class of all input. And now I, I partition it, as exactly the neural networks do, into cells. And imagine that somehow, miraculously, I know how to partition this into cells, such that the probability of mislabeling two samples in the same cell is smaller than epsilon. Okay? So this agreement within a cell, so this is some, something like a sampling theorem. I mean, uh, think about in Nyquist sampling. I don't need to sample every point in a function if it's band limited. I need to only to sample it in second frequency and all the other, so essentially there are only very few functions, very few value of the function. You don't mean geometric cells, do you? No, it's not necessarily geometric cells. Not necessarily geometric cells. So again, the question is what determines the size of the cell is a very important question. But so essentially I'm saying here, let's move from the cardinality bounds of or the, the, hypo the, the hypothesis class based bounds to what I call compression bounds. And essentially it's the partition. So now I need essentially one label per cell up to epsilon accuracy. So the number of labels, the number of functions that I now have, uh, essentially if you think about a specified constant within a cell. It's, it's now 2 to the cardinality of the partition, not 2 to the cardinality of the input. So I cosen the input, which is precisely what neural networks do. Now, if this is true, then you see that, uh, OK, so uh, it moves from the cardinality of if x to the cardinality of t. This doesn't look like a very dramatic thing unless something else happens. So again, I need, I need you to appreciate this notion of typicality uh, in what I'm saying now. So I, I hope you all know that for large enough problems, under some conditions like that allow me to factorize the distribution. So for example, Markov random fields, hidden Markov models, all the graphical models with some sort of bounded average degree. I mean, essentially, they're infinitely, all the, the physical models with Hamiltonian, which is it's just only finite interactions, neighbors, and so on. Uh, uh, so all these problems are essentially factorizable in the sense that if I let, take the log of the probability of a pattern, it looks like a sum of conditional, conditional independent terms. So this is beautiful. These are precisely the conditions under which 1 over n, the log of the probability, is converging in the large n limit to some, something which we usually call the entropy of the source. This is the Macmillan, Chan Macmillan entropy. OK, so this is precisely the condition under which information theory works. Usually we think about it in terms of sequences in time, but here I think about it in terms of the pattern itself. So think of an image as if it's made out of patches. So the probability of a pixel in an image is almost completely determined by the neighbors. So 
I can write the probability of an image as a product of many conditional independent probabilities. Now, so I have this limit. So the entropy, now, what we call typical images are precisely the cases where this limit exists and I'm close enough to the limit. And it turns out that almost everything is close enough to the limit in the large n limit. If, so in the number of patches of my input is, uh, is 100,000, I'm very much in this asymptotic regime. So this is central limit theorem, essentially. So the probability of each of these typical patterns is constant, essentially 2 to the minus the entropy, up to n here. And uh, I, if I also assume that those partitions are also typical in some sense, and this is actually a tricky part, uh, then the probability of each partition is 2 to the minus conditional entropy of this partition. So using this uh, classical information theoretic argument, I can now estimate the cardinality of the partition. So the number of typical functions in x is 2 to the entropy of x. I, I suppressed n here, it doesn't matter, it's in h. And the, the number of the, the typical size or the average size of a partition is 2 to the conditional entropy of h on t. So the size of the partition is 2 to the h divided by 2 to the h x given t, which is 2 to the i x t. OK? OK, that's beautiful. That's Shannon. <laughs> OK? But now, now I'm using it uh, in a slightly different way. So I know that the cardinality of the partition is 2 to the mutual information for typical patterns between the partition and the input. So plugging this in the <laughs> above line, I get 2 to the 2 to the i. But this double experiment is, is something miraculous. Because now if I put it back in the log on the, on the left hand side, I get a bound which looks like epsilon square is bounded by 2 to the mutual information between the input and the partition divided by a number of examples. OK, some of you may think, OK, 2 to the, two to the mutual information is fine. But let, that means that every bit of compression of the representation is equivalent to doubling the size of the data. K bits of compression is like multiplying the size of the training data by 2 to the k. So that's tragic. That's much better than reducing the dimensionality, which is linear there. It's exponentially better than dimension. OK, of course, when people see this, say, OK, so i is very small. Yes, i is very small. It's the log of the, uh, the size of your training data. And indeed, i is actually the minimal number of yes, no questions, or what we call queries, optimally specified for your data. So this is really how many bits I really need to know in order to identify the pattern. And this is just the size of a, a code. It's log of the size of the data. OK, so this is, to me, a, a rather convincing argument that reducing the information between the x and t is a useful thing for generalization. Now we can get to this uh, in a much more rigorous, uh, rigorous ways. Uh, I just don't have the time for it. OK, so it is the information plan that we are interested in. So the, the, the next question is, what are the ultimate bounds in this information plan which can have any representation whatsoever? And this is where the idea of the information buffner comes in. Uh, so essentially, we have been thinking about this, as I said, for many years. And it's, it boils down to a very simple variational problem. <laughs> Try to minimize the mutual information in the representation. I'm sorry, x hat is just the notation of information theory. But it's the same as t and h here. Uh, so I'm trying to minimize the information about the input while keeping the information about the input, the output at some level. Now, this is a, a well-defined uh, variational problem. Uh, and surprisingly, actually, has some interesting or sim self, uh, very simple uh, way of solving it, although it's uh, NP-hard in general. But never mind that. Uh, because, but it boils down to some sort of clustering. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, can I make you just go back just to make sure that I'm? Um, That's why we are here. I'm, I'm, I, as long as I'm not thrown away. Yeah. So, so this, you're saying this is an optimistic result, but to me, this seems, from the perspective of a bound, it seems really pessimistic because it's really saying that, you know, my this is like my generalization error, right? Right. It's saying that, you know, really the generalization error is quite huge, right? Because I've got two to the i. Um, oh, no. It's not, so, so this becomes interesting when i is smaller than log m. Yeah, that, okay, okay. so you're just going to argue why it's small. That, that yeah, and it's going to be small because stochastic gradient descent is going to reduce. It. Okay, so you're going to show us yes. that it's yes. going to be small. Otherwise, yes. I'm like really yes, that's the whole okay. point. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that reducing i about the input is exponentially more efficient for generalization than reducing the dimensionality of the class. Okay. 
Now, uh, so again, you can solve this problem. And we did it a long time ago. And, uh, but it is a kind of dimensionality of the class. That's right. No, no it is. But uh, I'm, instead of thinking about dimensionality of this class, I'm thinking about how well I can compress my input. Now, just to give you some different intuition, I said before that it seems that neural networks actually work for problems which are stable in the sense that if I add some small noise to the input, it doesn't change the label. Now, this is <coughs> generally accepted. Uh, as, 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 a, as a, this robustness criterion or this stability criterion uh, as, as true. I mean, so let's say if I am trying to learn a parity function, which is inherently unstable, I mean, changing one bit in the input is changing has a probability of randomizing, or I, I'm trying to learn an encrypted data or something like this. This is unstable even if I have a, a linear algorithm to, to solve it, and it's extremely sensitive to some, some small noise. These things are not good according to this uh, thinking, at least the theory, uh, for deep neural networks. They're never going to solve it. Now, if you add noise to the input, it means that there's some sort of partitioning of the input. All those cells which are just slightly perturbed in the right dimensions, which I can group into these cells. So stability and compression bounds are very closely related to each other. And actually, they can be compression bounds not with stability, with some other argument. So this, I, actually, this is a much more general argument. But OK, so, so how do you solve this uh, variational problem? What is the ultimate bound in this plan uh, beyond which you cannot have any representation? So this depends only and only on, on the joint distribution of x and y. There's nothing else there. I don't care about the algorithm. I don't care about the architecture. I don't care if it's happening in the, in the brain or in, uh, or in deep mind. <laughs> now, it's, uh, it's, and this bound is something which nobody can, can cross. I mean, if you get an alien civilization, it will not learn it better than this bound. <laughs> okay, so now, this bound is this black line here. So this, black, this bound is some sort of a, of a ray distortion function, uh, which means an information, it's an information theoretic bound. Above this black line, there are no representation whatsoever. Below this black line, you can have everything. And my argument, or our argument, is that and you can actually calculate this black line by some sort of self consistent equations, which essentially amount to alternating between the encoder and the decoder until something like EM uh, until convergence. And we know how to prove the convergence of this. Is this, this related to the Shannon bound? Yes, I mean, this, is, this is a variation of the, the rate distortion function in Sh of Shannon. Or the, and the algorithm is a variation of the Blout or Emoto algorithm for calculating the rate distortion function. Or if you want EM or alternating projection algorithms, there are many, many ways of thinking about it. Now, this picture is a bit exaggerated. I mean, so this is a very stochastic problem, just to enhance it. So the, the black line really goes down very sharp. But even for the problem I showed before, there was some sort of line there, which was this bound. Now, this, this bound is, is tricky, and there are many details in this picture, which I really want to emphasize. So first of all, I can actually achieve this bound, or actually calculate this bound, only if I have infinite sample, which means I have the, the full data. In, in reality, as we all know, uh, we don't have infinite samples. We, we, don't have, we have a tiny fraction of the data, especially for large problems. So we, we managed to calculate a different bound, which is this red, red line. And this red line is what you can expect if you actually do the best you can with a finite sample of your distribution. OK, this is very important. I don't have time to get into details. But what is most important here is that you keep the, 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 the partition very fine, just like the first layers of the neural network, you're going to have a very poor performance in terms of generalization. Remember, the more information I have about why, the better I generalize. So the very fine partitions are very poor. And there's some maximum to this red curve right here where I get from this finite sample my bet best performance. Now, of course, everything here is exaggerated. In reality, the red curve is closer to the black curve. But there's always this, I mean, depends on the problem, of course. But there's always this drop when I go to very fine partitions. And actually, it's very obviously, it's very obvious to anyone. If you have a very fine partition, let's say I random, I throw infinitely or many hyperplanes randomly on my data. And now I'm trying to label them with very few data. Most of the cells are going to be empty. I'm not going to see anything there. And then try to generalize from those cells is going to be very, very lousy. So I'm going to have very poor generalization. OK, so the whole point of the neural network is actually to coarsen this partition 
just enough that I have enough labeled data in all the occupied cells. The occupied cells are those that actually get inputs mapped to them. This is actually a tiny fraction of the true cells, of the whole cells because of the, because of the lower dimensionality of the data. Okay. So our goal is actually to get the last hidden layer to, to the maximum of the red curve. This will be optimal training for the neural network. Now the question is how, it, how does it happen? Okay, again, I just can. So essentially, there are two types of uh, components to my error. One of them is what I call the compression loss. This is what you get even if you have perfect sample, all the data, just by compressing the representation. And the other one is what I call a finite sample loss, which is the difference in the red and the black. And this is how much you can get if due, how much you lose due to the finite sum. So we want to minimize both of them in some sense. Now, okay, so now I go back to your question. I mean, what happens with overtraining and things like this? What happens with finite data? So now you, by now you're all uh, familiar with those uh, type of figures. <laughs> so this is the information plan traces of a neural network. And you see it now as a function of the size of the training data. So on the right you have a lot of training data, in this case 80% out of the 2 to the 12 patterns. <laughs> and uh, in the, on the left you have only very few training data, 5%. And again, everything is now average over randomizing training data and the initial conditions. So we see this nice, so you see again the, the, what I call the drift phase or the fitting phase up to this green line, which is more or less a linear curve that connects uh, somewhere. In, and then you get this slow compression phase which I, will, I tr actually argue is responsible for most of the success of the problem. Now, in, on, the, on the left you see that, okay, they, they compress and they still improve the information about I, about Y, which means they still improve generalization. On the other hand, if you have poor samples, you see that the fitting phase is essentially the same, but the compression is hurting you. Okay, I think, again, it's very obvious. I mean, if you have very, you're trying to course in your partition, with very few labels, the probability that you actually can guarantee that a partition is homogeneous with respect to the labels, which is essential for our argument, is very small. So you're going to have very coarse partition, but very lousy generalization, because you don't have enough data in every partition. Yes? So, Tali, my question is this coarsening really depends on the binning. So I, I wonder, I mean, o o these curves make only sense if you somehow coarsen and bin, right? Because yes. otherwise everything... I, I coarsen the partition, yeah. Yeah, but so how is the binning done and how do these curves depend okay. Okay. on how you... How Wait, you I, I hope that I'm going to satisfy you. I'm not sure I'm going to talk much about, much about the brain, but at least I want to be clear here. So, okay, so this is a, this drop of generalization with what I call over-compression is very, is very similar to overtraining or overfitting or, or things like this. And you see indeed that some sort of early stopping is going to avoid this compression if you don't have enough data. So there's this plunge. So actually, first of all, I argue uh, that all those lines, I mean, where the layers actually converge at the end, depends only on the problem itself. The data depend on bound, but the independent architecture. And they depend on the sample size, of course. So I can actually calculate theoretically just with a, a blouse or a motor-like algorithm the, the optimal bound. And I'm actually going to argue now that eventually the layers converge to this bound, all of them. Which means that they generalize in the best possible way. I mean, this is some sort of an optimality result for deep learning if it's true, which means nothing can do better than that. Yeah. By ultimately, you mean sufficient number of iterations? Sufficient number of epochs. And that's the tricky part. Now you see that somewhere in between, you get to somewhere in between a, a line like this. You remember, if you get lower late, essentially this type, this type of bound are some sort of interpolation between the red and the black curve of my previous bounds. Okay, so obviously, everything here depends on the gradients of the training. So it's actually very useful to look at the same video with the generalization error. And what you see is that the first phase, which is more or less up to here, the generalization error drops very quickly. And then essentially you get some sort of saturation of the error. It still goes down, of course, but very slowly. And during this uh, compression phase, or diffusion phase, as I like to call it, uh, it's, uh, uh, the error essentially saturates. It's actually not really saturated. It goes down, but you know, but actually, this is the, right, the wrong way of thinking about the error because I have to plot it in a logarithmic scale. I mean, the, going from one over a thousand to one over a million, 
makes a very big difference to industry. <laughs> uh, and uh, you don't see it here. So essentially, it's the information which is more like the logarithmic scale of the error. So going to 1 minus the error here, log of 1 minus the error is really the right thing to, uh, to, to look at. And this is actually directly related to information. But you see that towards convergence, the error essentially saturates. It's very small. It's very small changes. Now, what does it do to the gradients? So the error gradients, those things which are actually calculating the backpropagation algorithm, which are, no, no, through the chain rule go through the layers, uh, are very small because the error is small. So the derivative of the error is just the sum of the norms of the gradients for every layer. So, so, uh, so it's all very small. But on the other hand, the mini batches. Remember, we're using mini batches. We don't calculate the, the gradient. We calculate the, an approximate, a noisy approximation of the gradient by essentially calculating the gradient over small sets of the data. The mini batches are now going to, to fluctuate. So what I argue is that the signal-to-noise ratio of the gradient has entirely different behavior in the first phase and in the second phase of this compression. And this is indeed what we see. So what you see here, again, this is our network. It's this Eiffel Tower. And in different colors, you see uh, the mean of the gradient per weight and the standard deviation over the mini batches of the gradient per weight. So the solid line are the means, and the broken lines are the standard deviation. And what you see very strikingly, that up to about 300, this is a log-log scale, yeah? up to about 300 epochs, the mean is much larger than standard deviation, which means very clean gradients, essentially very high signal-to-noise phase. And above this, the mean goes down. They are different for different layers. But the standard deviation of the noise of the gradient jumps. And essentially, above this broken line, which is exactly where the green line in my information <laughs> plan uh, figures is, you see that I'm in what I call low signal to noise, to noise gradient. So, so a physicist, uh, if, if you think about stochastic processes, the first phase is essentially a drift phase. I mean, I just push it in a, in a gradient flow drift. The second phase, I'm dominated by noise. So this is diffusion. This is diffusion. Now, it's this, this noise, which is exactly the fluctuations from mini batch to mini batch of the gradient, which seem to do the whole trick. This is what is slowing me down. That's why it takes much, much longer time to, to move. But it's also improved generalization. Yes. yes. So just as a strategy, increasing batch size as you get to So increasing is reducing the noise. Decreasing batch size is increasing the noise. Right. So, so as you're training, if you increase batch size once you hit that point, Will yeah, train yeah I'll, I'll show you something about it. So when you change the mini batch size, you obviously change this picture, but not qualitatively. Just, just, you just move the phase transition. It's not really a phase transition. This is crossover between two types of behavior. But, uh, but uh, this is apparently, I mean, we, we looked at it and I, I was struck by it. Apparently, it was known already. Not only known, I mean, uh, Tommy Poggio, for example, analyzed this, uh, this figure in, in great detail, but got to some different conclusions. So essentially, you see this, even this mini bump in the, in, in the, in the gradients is actually falling to a, some sort of a flat minima, some sort of a crater, which is actually flat in most dimensions and narrow in some dimensions, which are precisely what we want. I mean, those are the narrow relevant dimension and the irrelevant dimension we are completely flat because it doesn't, it's not going to affect the error. <coughs> so, and actually, if you look carefully, in, in, as I do in this, in this figure, you see that the different towards convergence, when I get to a few thousand iterations, when nothing really changed, I'm still improving generalization, by the way. Although the training error is essentially zero, there's something which a lot of people reported. I mean, you get zero training error, and you keep on crunching this stupid backpropagation algorithm, and you get improvement in generalization. Why do you get improvement generalization? Because it's the mini, it's the fluctuation between the mini batches which is now doing the work. And what is really the fluctuation between the mini batches? These are really precisely, they're going to, I have one picture of Terry here and another picture of Terry here. The background is slightly different. This background is not important, the elimination change. So some mini batches are going to have gradient in this direction, which is connecting you with this background. Another one is connecting us to a different background. These fluctuations are very strongly dependent on the irrelevant dimensions of the data. Now, so I'm going to do a diffusion process, which is essentially free, unconstrained, because these dissertations don't depend on the, or don't affect the error. So it's a diffusion process, which looks like a flat diffusion in all the irrelevant dimensions of the data. Now, this flat diffusion, as I'm sure all of you know, 
diffusion, uh, unconstrained diffusion moves like a Gaussian with a square root of t, square root of t psi uh, bar, uh, standard deviation. So it grows like in width like square root of the time. Now it's the entropy of this diffusion process which essentially wipes out the irrelevant dimensions of the data. That's, that's my argument. I know that it's not. And by the way, if you look at the signal to noise ratio for the different layers, you see that the first layer has much higher noise and the second, and, and it goes down, but the signal to noise ratio, which is the difference in this log log plot, is constant. Now, the signal to noise ratio is essentially bounding the information between the label and the layer. So this is another completely independent verification of the same thing. Towards convergence, the information about the layer saturates, but the lower layer uh, have more noise in them. Okay so, so, okay, so this is just the answer to your question about the mini batches. When you, so that now you, I look at the signal to noise ratio. I'm sorry, this, uh, this was shifted somehow. But, and, and you compare the point, this green point, the point of maximum entropy in the, about the, the layer, at the maximum information about the layer uh, versus the drop in the signal to noise ratio. So here you see the signal to noise ratio and here you see this point and when you plot them, when you change the mini batch, you see that they all move but <laughs> they move together. Which means it is the drop in the signal to noise ratio which is responsible for the <laughs> compression. And actually we now know solving the Fokker-Planck equation uh, completely. So essentially, the change in the information plan is completely determined by the evolution of the gradients. So those of you who know something about the Fokker Planck equation, essentially it's the, the drift and diffusion terms, which are determined by the means and, 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 and covariance of the gradients. So if I know the gradients, I can calculate the information plan trajectories. So, but batch size, do you, what do you mean exactly batch? Batch, batch size is this mini batch size. I mean, how many examples do you use in order to tr calculate your gradient? For epoch. Whatever, I don't know how you call it uh, otherwise. You, you, you calculate the gradient on, on small groups of examples, not all, all the yeah. things. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is quite remarkable. I mean, it's, it's linearly dependent. By the way, if you go to full batch, this green line, as some people do, there's still noise, and the noise is due to the discretization of the problem, of the, of the step size, and due to all sorts of other things. But you see that it's essentially on the same line. So it is a much slower diffusion, but it's still a diffusive process. So therefore, even with full batch, you still compress, as some people report. Five minutes. Five minutes. Wow. Can I ask a question? So um, basically, the idea is that <clears throat> as you're diffusing through the space where error is constant, then eventually you land in a solution where the fluctuations from irrelevant details in the mini batches don't have as much effect, and then you'll slow down over there, right? You'll just tend to, you know, that's not going to kick you around as much because. Uh, okay, so so there are two two interesting questions. So first of all, uh, I'm, since I have only five minutes, yeah. I really want to compress yeah. some, some information here. First of all, here's the evidence that the layers actually convert to the optimal bound. Now, if you change the architecture, they converge to different places. But they all, the first layer is very high. This, you know, this is stretch. It's the information is from 0 0.98 to 1. And, and you see that they all converge to the bound. OK, so the question is, why do they converge to the bound? But so I already told you more or less. I mean, it's the Langevin equation, which converts to some sort of a Gibbs distribution. And, and, and it's the Gibbs distribution, essentially, through Bayes' law, which corresponds with this bottleneck compression. So essentially, the gist of it is that this expansion in the irrelevant dimensions is reducing the signal to noise ratio of the irrelevant components. Now, this happens, by the way, with arbitrary, there are infinitely many solutions to the problem. So it's not the neuron again, it's the, it's the layer, the whole layer which carried the information. I, can, I look at the correlation between different networks trained on the same data, and there's absolutely no correlation in the layer, in the neuron themselves. I need to get to the brain somehow. But, I, but really, maybe the most spectacular outcome of this analysis is that it tells me something about uh, the benefit of the hidden layers. So this is the same problem trained with one hidden layer on the top left, two or three up to six hidden layers on the bottom right. And, the st and again, it's the color code is the number of epochs. So dark purple is, is few number of epochs, and, and yellow is 10,000 epochs. OK, it's linear. And you see that with one hidden layer, you essentially get nowhere. I mean, it takes forever in these dimensions to actually converge to a good generalization. 
And surprisingly, when you increase the number of layers, you increase the complexity of the Apostles class, you increase the number of parameters dramatically, the convergence is much faster. And actually, it's exponentially faster, I argue, in terms of in, in the layers, in the number of layers. Essentially, you see that the six in the layers, everything is blue, which means I'm, I'm already at very high information about the label, very low in the epochs number. Now, this is something which has been reported by many people, not, not precisely, but people have noticed it. There's something funny about these deep neural networks. The more layers, the faster the convergence. Now, how can we explain it using what I just told you? So, it's actually very simple. If you think again about this diffusion phase, this is what takes most of the epochs. The diffusion phase is dominated by an exponential, uh, I mean, uh, increase of this, uh, this uh, or decrease of the signal to noise ratio of the irrelevant component, which amounts to a Gaussian expansion with time, which goes like square root of the number of steps. So, the time that it takes to increase the entropy, which is re directly related to the signal to noise ratio, is exponential in the compression. So delta t goes like exponent of delta sk, which is the difference between these two consecutive informations. Now imagine now that I need to compress with one layer. This is, takes time, which is e to the sum of those compressions between the layers. So essentially what happens due to this back propagation is that I do the compression in parallel. All of them are compressed, and they push each other because it's a Markov chain. So everything that I forget in the lower layer, I don't remember the higher layers. So essentially, this is some sort of a train with many engines. And the more engine as I get, the faster I move, because each of them is pushing me further. So I do this compression in parallel. So this already moves me from an exponent of the sum to the sum of the exponents. And actually, it's really done in parallel. So it's really the maximum of this which really governs the time. So this is an exponential, uh, exponential boost in time in, the, in this basic uh, scenario. So because I'm actually adding noise to all the layers, I really, I really generate this funny effect that all the layers help me. Now, of course, you should ask, so why don't you do infinite layers? But of course, this is an asymptotic analysis. And I'm, I, need, I need enough time and enough space, if you want, between the layers to actually get some leverage. OK, but that, then, then comes really the interesting part of the story. What determines the position of the layers in this plan? Actually, I was really hoping to get into it. But instead of it, I'll just show you two simple movies. This is, how, this is a multidimensional scaling of the first hidden layer, where red represent labels by 1, and black represent labels by 0, never mind. And what I, I want to show you, it's a very crude, uh, very low resolution uh, image, but you still see. And this is essentially the organization during the epochs of the first hidden layers. And you see that the clusters become more and more coherent in the sense that they, they, they get either stronger black or stronger red. The, the, the intensity is the confidence. And, but you see that this is a very mixed representation. I mean, so in this, this is a two-dimensional, multi-dimensional scaling analysis of the structure of the whole first hidden layer during training. OK, so what you actually get here is indeed there is some sort of clustering into coherent labels. That's, this is true. And I'm pushed into it because of my minimization of error. Now, you, you see again, I mean, this is getting more and more interesting, but the clusters are still very mixed. There's no, it's not a linear separable data in any way. So this is a network with one hidden layer? No, this is a network with six hidden layers. Uh, this six. is the first okay, layer. The first of the six. Okay. Now, just because I don't have too much time, I'm going to move to the next one. This is the last hidden, or one before the last hidden, the fourth layer in this six layer. And see what happens here. It's actually quite striking. So, so it's, again, I mean, originally you have some bias uh, problems. So it's the, the red and left and white are not uh, the same probability. But eventually, you see that in the last hidden layer, the red and black really nicely separate. And eventually, the red is to the right, and the left is the black is to the left. But you see also a dimension reduction. And eventually, everything is going to collapse to very low dimension, in this case, one dimension. Excuse me. Why? Yes. So how did you project here? Is it just a random projection in two dimensions? No, no, it's not random. I mean, I'm trying to, p to put the layer, in, which is a high dimensional structure, in two dimensions, preserving the distances as much as I can. Right. So, the Euclid so the Euclidean distance is, is forced to be similar. It's a just visualization. <laughs> but it shows you precisely what I think many people should have seen already. 
that there is a combination in the training of compression into clusters of this partition and, and reduction of dimension. You see, this, this is eventually getting to a line yeah. on both cases. So this is another way of thinking about these manifolds that you have all been talking about. You, you actually see it. Now, how is this related to my diffusion analysis? So essentially, again, I can look at the signal to noise ratio. Since everything is under control, I know the problem. I know exactly where the mutual information is. I can simply measure how much information about every, let's say, frequency component of the, of the problem or something like this is actually preserved during the layers. And you see that, indeed, the relevant information is moved on and the irrelevant is suppressed because of this diffusion process. And it's very nicely suppressed. So I, I'm out of time. And unfortunately, I really didn't give you the, the new part of the story, which is also related to Noga here, but uh, never mind. So again, so let me try to summarize, and uh, I'll finish with this. So first of all, we have been applying, we are applying the same ideas. I mean, this compression without losing information, because we have this one principle and one set of equations that solve it to many, many different problems on many, many different scales. You know, all the way from analysis of you know the fly H1 cell <laughs> with Bialik and others, which we did in the 90s, uh, all the way to anal analyzing languages and uh, occurrences of words, and that's what Noga is doing now. So, so and, and actually, a lot of training data we apply to the Morris motorways, for example. We apply it to control problems. Uh, and I actually argue that, again, what the animal is trying to represent is some sort of a compressed representation of the relevant of the input under constraint of performance. Now, putting it in, in a reinforcement learning framework is giving us, getting us to control theory uh, in a very interesting way. I, see, I, don't, I didn't have time to talk about it. But, but what is really striking is that it's essentially the same principle that goes through all those scales. Now, what is interesting about deep learning is that it generates these hierarchical representations, which we call this uh, successfully refinable uh, codes. Essentially, each layer is just coarsening the previous one, and they get stuck in this diffusion precisely when the topology of the problem is changed. Now, to answer your, your question before, the, the problem was selected very carefully by me uh, uh, to, to be spherically symmetric. So these are 12 points which are scattered uniformly on a three-dimensional sphere. And the label depends on some sort of linear combination of the dipole and quadrupole moments of these points. So the points are plus or minus. So which means that the label is going to be invariant rotations under SO3 or whatever. Now, in this case, due to the understanding of the bottleneck problem, I know exactly what, where those representation chain, which are called bifurcation points or phase transitions, happen. And they happen, because it's a spherically symmetric problem, they happen precisely when you lose one of the irreducible representation of the symmetry. So this is really nice physics, <laughs> nice uh, atomic physics. So essentially, uh, again, so there's some group theoretic structure behind the structure of the layers. And that's something we are now getting to see at last. What stops the diffusion, or what is halting the layers, is a change, a phase transition in the position. Cluster have to split or merge together, which means another dimension, another relevant dimension is lost or appear. So that's beautiful, because we can actually have a complete theory, some, some sort of bifurcation theory like this, which tells you where the layers get stuck eventually in the problem, and why adding more layers depends on how many of the irreducible symmetries of the problem you actually capture in your lab. So this is just like water filling that you see in a Gaussian channel, but the water filling is not on the dimensionality, it's the, on the representation of the group. So this is another talk that I would love to give at some point. But Anyway, so essentially what I showed you is that information plan, I mean this analysis of your information theory is giving us quite interesting visualization of deep learning. It tells us something ab about the advantage of the layer, which is mostly computational. It's not uh, expressive. I don't believe this. Uh, the, the problem is just the network are, are, far, are rich enough to express anything. But the layers are there to enhance the, the optimization. And it has a lot to say about uh, what we understand about deep neural networks in general, both in terms when you apply it to data or we, we think about the brain in the same terminology. But Maybe I'll do it some other time. No, just say, I'm here for the four, say next four weeks. about so. the brain. I mean, in other words, are, are you, you claimed at the beginning okay. that uh, any learning algorithm for the, you know, that, that would, uh, whether it's a 
biological hierarchy or deep learning? Yeah. So, so first of all, the hierarchy makes perfect sense in some, in some cases, and, and, and we can actually analytically explore it in, in some very special you know, toy problems. <laughs> okay, that, it's nice. I mean, so at least we have some toy problems where we can actually understand what deep learning is doing. In, with many layers, not just one or two layers. Now, the other, the other thing is that everything seems to be driven by noise. I mean, most of this diffusion process is, random, is a random walk of the weights. And what does it tell, about, uh, tell us about things like receptive fields, or you know, uh, what the connectivity is, is actually meaningful or not? I don't know. So uh, you know, this goes back to the arguments. I, I'm not saying that the brain is a deep neural network, and it's definitely not unconstrained. It's not fully connected. I mean, everything that we see here is very specific, and they have to be taken with a lot of un generalizing to biology. This is, a, this is an argument, a problem. But what I'm saying is, so we actually looked you know, how much information is actually preserved in each one of these neurons. So there's complete. Although they are very different, I mean, I, when I look at the correlation within the weights of two random choices of these 100 ne networks, network networking, there's no correlation. I, I can't identify a cell which is responding to one to one feature in the data, at least in, in yeah, this. That's what we call distributed representation. Right, right, that, that was right. And the, the actually, I need I need this redundancy for this argument to work. Right. So, by the way, things like pruning or or no uh, uh, all sorts of regularization that uh, that specify the networks. Uh, I mean, uh, drop-offs, there are many names now, uh, that essentially, so they actually, yes, they, they reduce the dimensionality, but they slow the diffusion. Mm -hmm. They slow the diffusion, and this can hurt you if my argument is right. So, no, so of course, the, uh, pr network, uh, connections are expensive, biologically, so if there is a cost of making a synapse, then you're going to get an entirely different type of solutions. So, so one of the things that is very dramatic about the hierarchy and the developing brain is that it goes through these critical periods that start from the periphery. Like V1 has this critical period that lasts, you know, for, you know, in a cat for a couple of weeks, and then the learning slows down. It doesn't go away. It slows down, and then the same thing happens at the next higher level, and, and that goes up, in fact, until late adolescence when the prefrontal cortex slows down. So, is is is, the, is there any? Have you noticed any uh, change in the degree to which weights change in well, the I, I, I want to be very careful not expanding, not extrapolating from, from these toy experiments to... to but but, yeah, but we, we actually, we, I'm definitely interested, but, uh, and I'm willing to take the, the blame and the responsibility on me. Uh, in, I actually argue that those type of hierarchical representations are critical for any organization of this type. Now, so we look at the auditory. Uh, the audio system with Eli Nelkin uh, for many years now, and uh, he is really very fond of, of this uh, of this uh, stages. Of course, we have similar things in the visual system, but actually the auditory is more, more complicated. And 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 uh, and we really manage. I mean, this is an ongoing work. We started it 15 years ago uh, to identify the auditory invariants which are preserved in each one of the layers, all the way to A1. So I don't know. Now, now I actually want. Okay, maybe. I mean, here's the theory. I mean, I don't need to train a neural network for this. What I need is to, to identify the symmetry group, or something like this, uh, and then analyze and see which type of the components of the symmetry are lost in every one of the representations, which are present. And I actually argue that there, there may be a very interesting way of doing it. Also for vision, and if you know, this is, I need another life uh, for this. <laughs> right. So I'm mainly interested in the role of feedback. So it, it can be the whole story, right? There's, there's still room for improvement, I hope. And I was thinking sure. this, this Gibbs sampling, Gibbs sampling is super inefficient in general. Right? It's not Gibbs sampling, uh, it's, it's uh, random walks, yeah. But it's right, 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 right. okay, yeah. So is there a no. way to guide this? Okay, very, very good question, of course. So the first question I get from new computer scientists, of course, okay, so now improve the algorithm. I mean, uh, stochastic <laughs> gradient sense is stupid. I mean, uh, do something better. Okay, so the direct insight we get from this analysis is that towards convergence, there, are some, there is a, this, intermediate, this in, 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 intimate connection between the encoder and the decoder of the problem. By the way, the way we estimated, we looked at the real neural network, and actually I argue that it is on the curve, on the optimal curve, is by ex mu measuring the mutual information of the encoder of the neural network, and then compare it what is, what is the optimal trade-off, what is this value of beta, on uh, temperature on which this lies, and we got a very nice fit. Now this, this seems that somehow stochastic gradient sense is solving this uh, very hard information bottleneck problem. Now, uh, on the other hand, 
I know I have uh, this Blout Arimoto. I mean, I have this uh, completely different types of condition between the encoder and decoder. So why don't impose this on the weights? Okay, so we are trying to do that. But now I don't know. Uh, probably Dimitri left, <laughs> but I need some expert on, on computational complexity. Uh, the, we, it turns out that if you can actually enhance this exponential, what, what you call a super uh, critical slowing down or whatever uh, of the diffusion, uh, if you actually make this instead of exponentially slow, a polynomially small, then there are many hard problems I could actually solve so fast than what we know today. And this sounds like uh, ah, you are in a <laughs> you don't have to be careful. So, so I need to. So I don't believe there is a universal way of ex exponentially enhance uh, gradient descent. Uh, but uh, no, this is complete speculation. Uh, you can probably improve it in many problems which have internal structure, where this type of alternating projection is going to help you. And, and I think this is a very valid and very uh, proper approach. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this analysis maybe po points also to a weakness of, of actually this deep learning approach. And this is this diffusion phase. Is this really efficient? Because I mean, what you really would like there is to have a more structured approach where you can say, OK, for example, in the example of, of Terry in different backgrounds, right? To figure out what belongs to Terry, what pixels belong to Terry in the background, you don't want to learn this in the diffusion process. You would like to extract some rules maybe from other objects that you're seeing. Okay, okay. And so, I mean, in a way. No, so uh, personally, I don't think it's, I mean, in order to actually make sense of the background, in all the possible different backgrounds, I need a lot more data than I actually have. What I have now are images of Harry in different illumination, different uh, locations, different, and I need to separate the, 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 the stable features from the unstable features. What you are suggesting, learn the unstable features. Okay, no, no, I don't believe it. No, no, no. I mean, I'm actually, the fact, I'm not saying it. The, I'm the, saying the fact that there are irrelevant no, dimensions. No, I'm saying something else. Yeah. I'm saying extract rules that uh, apply to many objects rather than just uh, looking at all these examples and, need, uh, and, and, and requiring this diffusion process. Maybe, uh, and I think this is a much harder problem. I mean, essentially what I want is, is a very a very simple, and I, and, I, and I argue that diffusion is doing it for you, a simple way of ignoring the irrelevant dimensions. So actually, what I'm saying is that most of the learning in deep learning is done by the second order effect. Not, it's not the, the error itself is how to decorrelate the differences in the background in the irrelevant dimensions. So I compare two images and say, if they have this as the same label, that something else, something is irrelevant. The, the fact that I, I see you in the background and sometimes see him in the background, this is irrelevant. So this network has to somehow, and, and it turns out that this, exactly this diffusion process is reducing the signal to noise. Now, I think it's actually a very clever, <laughs> Despite that, it sounds a very clever way of compression. It's compression by nodes. Now, I know, OK, the, the intuition is of everyone, especially information theorists, by the way, <laughs> is that there must be a very elegant and mathematical algorithm that does it better. Yeah, maybe. I don't know it yet. <laughs> what about dynamically adjusting the batch size? So this would somehow be reminiscent to a simulated yeah. yeah, so this is an annealing-like uh, yeah. uh, argument. It's going to, it may improve things, but I don't believe that this is going to move from exponential polynomial. I mean, this is going to change some, sometimes, sometimes the scheduling, but it's not a, I don't think it's going to change the going game completely. Of course, people are doing it, using all sorts of dynamic regularization, dropouts. This is the kind of thing that people are doing. Yeah. Yes, uh, maybe. I'm trying to reconcile in my mind your theory with uh, Tommaso Poggio's theory uh, for deep learning which is really based on the fact that if the functions, the input-output function that you're trying to learn is compositional, then we get these benefits from, from multiple layers. Uh, and I cannot reconcile the two theories. I mean, they're both fascinating, and, and I don't know how to combine them. So I want to have your perspective on this. But what do you say that is common with what Tony Poggio is saying, and, and what is different? No, I think that there, are, there are many. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any arguments with Poggio. I don't certainly not uh, when this is recorded. I'm but uh, no, I, I mean, I think that Poggio got the right picture in terms of the nature of the convergence of flat minima. This is, this is very true. We, we see it also. Uh, I, I, I think there is a and I'm, I'm actually saying, look, there is some, something which determines the position of the layers. They get stuck. 
Now, since my mechanism is diffusion, also Fortier's mechanism is diffusion in some sense, uh, uh, it's, it's a random walk, I'm asking myself, you know, it's a little physics background, what is uh, stopping random walks or diffusion? And my physics uh, tells me that there's something that you all know for a long time, there's what we call critical slowing down or diffusion. I mean, near phase transitions, <laughs> the energy, the free energy landscape becomes very rough, either to, due to entropy barriers or ent energy barriers, and that stops diffusion. That's going to, so there's something in the layers that eventually halt them, and now I'm looking, okay, so what can cause roughening of the landscape? And, and, uh, and now we see that in the bottleneck problem, there are phase transitions. And these phase transitions precisely uh, seem to uh, hold uh, uh, some of those uh, layers. Now, of course, if there are many phase transitions, you actually move through them slowly, but, there's not, but if there is a structure to the problem, and I believe this compositionality is directly related to what I call irreducible representation, thing like this. I mean, I can actually factorize the symmetry into, into smaller groups or subgroups. And I'm losing each one of them in a certain point in this, in this uh, process. There may be a very nice way of putting these two things together. I don't think there's any contradiction. Okay, last question. Uh, so if I understand correctly, basically, until while you're learning relevant dimensions, you are in the drift phase and then you get into the diffusion mode. So I'm wondering whether, I mean, do you think trying to train the same network on the same data on different tasks at the same time sort of kick down your phase transition or, or just make it worse? And then the second thing, these are all feed-forward networks, right? So well, if, if you start putting recurrence, what what happens? That's become like a washing machine of uh, irrelevant information. All right. So, so, so the the recurrent question is a big question. Uh, the only thing I can tell you that many people uh, consider now recurrent neural networks some sort of a Markov chain in time, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which you can think of each layer as a different pool of neurons which are participating in activity now, and then another pool is but and, and actually the same neuron can appear in different layers and so on. Uh, and this seems to make sense, and, and, and in a recurrent network, can actually have many, many layers in that way, essentially, all the time of reverberation in the network. Uh, we are thinking about it. I didn't, I didn't do any analysis of this, so to, to this, uh, this information is theoretical analysis. Now, your first question is actually important because it's directly related to things like transfer learning and, and, uh, and whether you can actually train the, f the first layer seems to be more general than the last layer. So I take an object recognition network which was trained on cars and use it to faces uh, just by retraining. So the first layer is actually capture the large symmetry, translation, rotation, whatever components, which is true for any object recognition problem, scaling, and then the layer, later layer encode the more fine details. I think this is, a, this is a valid approach and this type of analysis seems to, but the nature of which symmetry is left at what point in the, in the hierarchy is actually not so obvious. I mean, it's not always the, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have to stop. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we start again in about uh, 20 minutes, so five after uh, the hour, we are half, uh, half an hour behind. Uh, so, yeah, five after 11. Good.